Mal Sinschult is his time. Ethnobiology as a discipline has grown to include numerous subdisciplines, each with their own approaches to investigate the interactions between people, organisms, and culture, some of which are highlighted here. Now, it's important to understand that to highlight this interdisciplinary methods in ethnobiology, most ethnobiologists to date are either trained biologists that are comfortable in conducting interviews and asking questions about plants, animals, or environmental use, or they are trained social scientists that are interested in about identifying, cataloging, or learning about plants and animal species. And given such a multifaceted set of backgrounds, ethnobiologists today are stemming from a range of expertise from anthropology, pharmacology, um, sociology, archaeology, to linguistics and other related fields. And given such a sheer methodological complexity involved, ethnobiologists today have been exposed to a wide variety of analytical methods of inquiry that combine the intuitions, the skills, the methods, and biases from researchers in all of these areas. And because of this methodological complexity, academics have criticized ethnobiology or its subdiscipline ethnobotany for, for lacking a consistent methodological rigor. And while this may be considered a limit or a challenge as the discipline continues to evolve, it's hardly a limitation and will indeed prove to be the contrary. In fact, it is highly probable that diverse methodologies are absolutely necessary to understand the complexity surrounding some of the world's current biocultural crises. And to illustrate this, I invite each of us here today at ESPD 55, all of us from our range of expertise and backgrounds to consider how we might apply our efforts collectively to use them to ensure that we provide practical solutions to address the current social and cultural challenges that currently threaten the stability of social and ecological systems while simultaneously addressing the needs of indigenous peoples and local communities. This is critically important, now more so than ever. Let's face it, we're now living in a world where we're providing practical solutions to address environmental and cultural challenges that threaten the current stability of social and ecological systems are going to require creative and collaborative efforts that transcend the boundaries of academic disciplines, of individuality, of colonial epistemologies embedded within research, social inequalities, and notions of academic superiority. To put it bluntly, we all need to work together. And perhaps in this context, ethnobi ethnobiology as a discipline of diverse methodologies provides us an essential platform where we can unite our expertise and knowledge to inspire change. I think each of us here in this room at ESPD5, we possess the knowledge and essential skills that may hold the keys to a sustainable future. And this is why ESPD55 is such a legendary and important event that I'm deeply honored to be a part of. For within, the, for within this space, we have some of the most brilliant minds and creative thinkers and supporters near and far uniting for a common goal, to plant the seeds that inspire change. And this is exactly the necessary catalyst needed to facilitate the development of collaborative partnerships and aimed at providing creative solutions to re required to address current biocultural conservation challenges. Now, while many of us are long been aware of the plight of indigenous peoples of the Amazon basin, including the devastating forces at work that pose undeniable threats to the biological and cultural webs of life that are responsible for the persistence of much of the cultural, the chemical, and the linguistic, and biological diversity of the planet. It's clear that we have so much and so far to go. You know, one of the most important challenges that we face today, you know, a current biocultural conservation challenge and sustainability concern of the Amazon basin that has yet to thoroughly captivate our widespread attention and urgently needs our collective efforts to address is the increased exploitation of ayahuasca, specifically its source plants, Benesteriopsis capi and Psychotria viridis for ayahuasca and Dibleteris cabrana for yahe. Now, We've only begun to witness the effects of increased harvest pressures of ayahuasca source plants, 
where Benasterops' copy shortages have been reported in and around major cities like Pucallpa and Iquitos, where ayahuasca production has grown exponentially over the last decade to provide the brew to an estimated 100 to 200 centers in the area, in addition to the exportation of the concentrated brew to various ayahuasca communities and practitioners around the world. And to date, it is unclear how many ayahuasca source plants remain in the wild. And we can only estimate how many tons of biomass from these plants are harvested annually to meet exponentially growing supply and demand chains. And although there have been considerable efforts towards sustainability, where growers and harvesters, syncretic religious organizations like the Union de Vegetal and the Santo Daime have planted more ayahuasca source plants in and around the Amazon basin, it is unclear whether or not these efforts will be enough to provide ayahuasca for the foreseeable future. With, now, while increased harvest pressure and intensity does not always result in a decline of culturally important plants, like ayahuasca source plants, it is clear that these plants may become overexploited while ayahuasca production continues and becomes globalized and this brew becomes commercialized. Therefore, it is essential that we evaluate sustainability concerns. And in moving forward, it's really important to ask ourselves collectively, what do we know about ayahuasca sustainability? It is clear that much time and focus has been spent by social and natural scientists studying ayahuasca from both pharmacological and social cultural perspectives. Incredible advancements have been made in studying the bruise chemistry and pharmacology. We now have evidence to support that ayahuasca consumption can enhance creativity, it can reduce anxiety, it can exhibit antidepressant and anti-addictive effects, improve psychological well-being and quality of life. And more recently, there's evidence to suggest that ayahuasca consumption can facilitate the formation of new neurons, all of which indicate that ayahuasca acts on multiple levels of neural complexity. And this also points to the great therapeutic potential of ayahuasca in contemporary medicine and traditional medicine. And we know that the use of ayahuasca is deeply rooted in the social organization and worldviews of numerous cultural communities and practitioners throughout the Amazon basin. And there's no doubt that many lineages of vegetalistas, maestros, maestras, pais, taitas, pradrinos, and other religious and shamanic practitioners are experts in navigating the inner domains of consciousness, the inner paths to outer space, and the realms of the spirits invoked by the ayahuasca-induced experience. Whew. <laughs> 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 But there remains significant knowledge gaps on how ayahuasca responds from an ecological perspective. And we have yet to thoroughly develop collaborative partnerships, synergistic efforts worldwide, a global ayahuasca project focused on sustainability so that ayahuasca will remain for future generations. Now, many of us here today that have consistently taken this medicine, whether for personal or spiritual growth, rites of passage, religious beliefs, healing and diagnosing of illness, we hold a deep appreciation for ayahuasca. And those of us that have embraced the wisdom of the teacher plants, if we listen, we now have a responsibility of reciprocity, a responsibility to support sustainable ayahuasca harvest and production. We must not let this precious opportunity to respectfully learn how to manage ayahuasca production slip through our fingertips. There is much more at stake behind revenue streams of commercialization and subsistence of local livelihoods. These are entire ways of being at stake. Therefore, we must honor the wisdom of the ages and learn from the symbiotic relationships of the natural world to ensure that the diversity of ways of being and ways of knowing inspired by ayahuasca remain and continue their dialogue with humanity in reverence. In doing so, we must learn more about the ecology and the demography of these plants and how they're responding to increasing harvest pressures over time. This is a necessary step towards sustainable ayahuasca production. In addition, it is essential that we thoroughly understand and value the knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities and how they are actively managing ayahuasca source plants. This will incredibly inform collaborative efforts towards sustainable production, and ways in which 
one can inform the other from science and from the local knowledge. Now, what I will introduce all of us here today is integral projection models, IPMs hereafter. Now, IPMs are a more contemporary quantitative technique in ethnobiology or its subdiscipline ethnoecology that may hold keys to understanding how we can develop a sustainable future for ayahuasca production. Now, I IPMs are time discrete demographic models that ultimately have been developed in population ecology over the last several decades and have gained momentum for the ability to project the population dynamics of a given species in response to various anthropogenic and environmental factors such as climate change and harvesting intensities. Now in this context, IPMs describe how a given population structured by individual state variable or a continuous trait changes in discrete time. And this is one of the advantages of IPMs compared to other population models because they avoid any biological consumptions linked to artificial synthetic divisions of life stages across the ontogeny or life history of a given species. Now, I've more recently applied this population model to my own ethnobiological research, which has proven useful in developing a preliminary understanding of how several ayahuasca populations may be doing ecologically from a conservation standpoint. And although I will primarily focus on Benesteriopsis capi ayahuasca for this talk, the same methodology can be applied to other teacher plants, such as Psychotria viridis, the other source plant for ayahuasca, and Dibleteras cabarana, the other source plant for yahe. Now, in this context, IPMs are a powerful tool because it allows us to quantify measures of growth, survival, and reproduction across the life history of ayahuasca to make robust predictions on population level patterns that allow us to have a mechanistic understanding of how these populations are responding to harvest from an ecological standpoint. So for those of us less familiar with ayahuasca, ayahuasca or Banisteriopsis capi from a botanical perspective is a Malpighiaceae liana. It's botanically described as a liana with brown bark with dark green ovate to lanceolate leaves about seven inches in length, two to three inches wide. The inflorescences are axillary with many five petaled flowers that are pink to rose colored. The fruit produced is a samaroid schizocarp consisting of about two to three samaras connected at a torus. Flowering generally occurs between December and August with samara production between March and August in tropical systems. It can also reproduce asexually or clonally where new ramets are formed to take, um, take root either when um, ayahuasca is cut or when host trees are fell or also due to outplanting of cut stems. Now, to encourage a deeper understanding of IPM, 